Rosie, thank you very much for that introduction. I, ha I have to tell you all that I have been introduced by uh, usually young women who say uh, we'd like to introduce Helena Kennedy, the lawyer who represents women and other criminals. Uh, and, uh, um, the truth is that having practiced for over 40 years at the bar, um, I, uh, I actually haven't spent all of my time representing women. Um, I've done many uh, uh, other kinds of case, and much of it to do with national security and terrorism and uh, espionage and all manner of, of, of issues. Um, but when I started practicing at the bar in the 70s, um, the bar was a very different place from the way it is today. Um, only 6% of us were women when I qualified, and the majority of women were being pushed into um, areas that were um, seen to be uh, suitable for women. Um, they, were, they were pressed into family law and children's law, and uh, uh, it was quite difficult to, to break that idea that there were areas that were appropriate for women and others that weren't. Well, I became a criminal lawyer, and, but even as a criminal lawyer, um, I found myself in those early stages doing far more uh, cases involving women than, than my male colleagues did. And I think that part of it was that, you know, there used to be a, a thing where um, I, uh, I sort of had a niche practice of representing Scots who got into trouble in London. And uh, so after every cup final, you know, I would have a, a roaring trade. They'd say, get that, get that girl, you know, who's going to be able to translate for us. And so, um, but I also represented a huge uh, posses of of young, uh, usually Glasgow girls who ended up um, on the game in London. And it, it meant that I, I started looking at the law from the perspective of women, looking at the ways in which it was different. And uh, I'm afraid it has affected um, my, uh, my view, and I wrote about it, I, I broadcast a lot about it at a time when very few people were talking about this kind of stuff. And throughout the 80s and into the 90s, and as you heard from Rosie, I wrote a book in the, in the early 90s, just after I became a Queen's Counsel, um, about um, that whole, a review of how the law affected women. And lots of young women now come to me and say to me that they went into law because of reading that book. Well, I want many, many more of them to come into the law uh, uh, as a result of reading this new book. But I want it really, it's a book that was really written to speak to men because we're not going to be able to change this and to change the way in which our society works unless men actually see this as an issue for men too. It's not enough for, for uh, issues like how we deal with rape cases, sexual assault, sexual harassment in the workplace, domestic violence. These are all areas that need men to be actually calling out bad behavior and talking about it as um, uh, actively as women do. Now, the big thing that led to the rewrite, and it's, a, and it's actually, I've brought Eve Was Framed up to date a number of times over the years, and my publishers were quite keen for me to do it again. But the big changing moment, of course, um, which meant that I said, I can't rewrite this book, I can't just update it, there has to be a new book, because so much has happened, but not enough has changed. And the Harvey Weinstein Me Too moment at the end of 2017, it was in October of that year that it was uh, unleashed, this incredible tsunami of, um, first of all, you know, women in Hollywood complaining about his behavior. But it then gave uh, rise to this uh, uh, campaign, and, and it's been global. And I say that as someone who now works very much in the, in the international field. Uh, a lot of my work takes me to different places. I've just been dealing with Khashoggi and that killing by the Saudis of Khashoggi in Turkey and was there with the um, UN rapporteur. Um, I've, I've just been out in Brazil, as, as Rosie was saying, looking at training of, of the judiciary in dealing with still remaining cases around torture um, and how kind of that eats into the culture of policing in places. But uh, um, wherever I go and when I meet with women in the law, women in the judiciary, and then go to speak to gatherings of women, 
the same complaints are made the world over. And the Harvey Weinstein moment of Me Too allowed women um, to actually start talking about the things that they've experienced. And I know that it has been painful for many men um, because, of course, um, the internet is being used to name and shame without um, often um, it was with women being remaining anonymous, um, but naming um, people who they've said have made their lives misery, a misery at work. And, and the concern for me as a lawyer, of course, is that I believe in due process. I don't want people to be tried online. Um, but I see it, and my analysis of it is, that if your legal system fails whole sections of your society, then it leads to civil disobedience. And what Me Too is, is a form of civil disobedience. Our law is actually emanates from a social contract. It's a contract in which we, you know, we develop law and the, the relationship between the citizen and the state is, is, is moderated through legal systems which say, bring us your grievances and we will deal with it in a way that is responding to rules and we will deal with it in order to secure justice for the parties. And what women are saying is, and they're saying this everywhere, is that they're doing like the suffragettes, they're putting a brick through the window of the legal systems and are saying, your systems do not deliver for us. And I'm afraid if you look and if you read this book, um, and I very carefully and forensically went through all of the evidence um, and the changes that have been made and the efforts which I've been part of, of trying to reform the law on many of these areas, trying to make the rules different, trying to reformulate some of the black letter law as it affected women because it was failing women. And all I can tell you is that it hasn't done the business. Reform of the law itself is not enough because underpinning all of this are attitudes which persist, which are detrimental to justice for women. And the attitudes which persist is about double sexual standards, ways in which women are silenced when they come forward with complaints, and the ways in which women do not have confidence in the system because of the demeaning uh, humiliation they often experience when they come to speak about what has happened. Now, um, after uh, the Harvey Weinstein exposure, I kept meeting and sitting at dinner tables where people would say to me, but you know, um, um, and it's very, it's, it's very interesting when you have this, these exchanges. Older women would often say, well, I don't know why people are complaining. We had to deal with that, you know, 20, 30 years ago, and we just had to sort of belt somebody uh, um, or, you know, um, uh, slap them on the wrist and, uh, and deal with it in, in the best way possible, and, it, and, and we just got on with life. And why aren't women still able to do that? Um, I've heard older women in the, in the law saying, um, if you aren't able to deal with groping uh, men and old judges who are predatory, then you shouldn't be at the bar. Um, and the answer to all of this is, why? Why should it be that young women in the workplace should be doing the things that we, as an older generation of women, had to do, of running round tables, of having to avoid certain people who were uh, mentioned to you. Don't get in the lift with Charlie. Don't be left uh, late at night working on a brief in chambers if he's around. All of those things. I remember the business of going up library steps to get books, you know, law reports from the, from the top shelf at the request of pupil masters, only to find the groping uh, hand going up the back of your leg. And why is it that young women are having to experience this stuff? And sometimes it, of course, is more grave than, than, than that. Why is it that the workplace is such a dangerous situation for so many women? And, of course, you're hearing the stories that are told by um, articulate women often in the professions. But I can tell you that if you speak to young women who are working on cases in the employment tribunals or in cases where women lose their jobs because they become pregnant or women who are wanting to, to take on uh, um, um, predatory behavior by their supervisors, the stories are told over and over again of women who are working on the shop floor, who are, if they ask for overtime, they want time off because they've got a sick child, they, or they do want overtime because they, they need the extra cash, and it's down on their hands and knees, and they're expected to deliver to supervisors down in the, in the, the basements of factories and of workplaces up and down the country. So we have to recognize that this is actually much more endemic than people realize, the extent to which women are put up with um, gross misbehavior in the workplace. And, uh, and the Me Too uh, movement 
around the world, from Japan through uh, whole stretches of Europe, of course, but also in India, where I was speaking um, uh, in November, and speaking to, to gatherings of women, women lawyers, and talking about the cases that they do and the extent to which um, this is a problem um, everywhere. Why is it um, that, uh, that women have felt silenced? And of course, it's why I've, I've changed the title this time around um, to, to talk about shame. The ways in which, um, when women have sought to draw attention to the ways in which um, uh, they suffer um, uh, abuse, um, the ways in which they were silenced. And so Harvey Weinstein was not something new. Remember, and we actually just had James Harding talking about the really important work that Andrew Norfolk did in revealing um, the, the Rotherham, the, the many of the cities, I mean, Oxford, where, where I've just been um, uh, heading up a college for a number of years. You know, the ways in which um, young girls um, were, um, have been abused and the silence that was around it and the collusion by police and social services of basically feeling that they were trashy girls who somehow didn't deserve the protection of law and the protections that should have been afforded to them, these underage girls. But the silence around that it wasn't the first. Remember the business of, um, of uh, the scandals at the BBC, um, uh, and James Harding must have been there when some of that was, 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 um, was coming to light. The Jimmy Savile business, the Rolf Harris business, the ways in which there has been silence about the behaviours of powerful men abusing their power. Um, and, uh, and, when those and it wasn't that women didn't complain. Complaints were made. Um, but they were hushed up because somebody was too valuable an asset. And that business of the value of an asset, um, and of course it's very rarely that women are in that position within institutions, is one of the problems. And so it's the Catholic Church, it's, uh, it's children's homes, it's, uh, it, you know, it's, it's in many of these places, higher education institutions, in many places of, of learning and so on, where people have a power relationship, um, the abuse of it um, um, has, has become, you know, the lid has been taken off, um, but what is one of the scandals is that it wasn't that people didn't speak. People did try to speak, but were not listened to. And... Um, and one of the things that um, made me really particularly concerned was that in that silencing, we've seen the, the use of law itself. So that, for example, non-disclosure agreements, NDAs, um, have been used probably much more extensively than anybody has realized in order to cover up the abuse of senior uh, men in different positions with regard to uh, young women in the workplace. I um, was advising, and um, she's made it clear that I can talk about this case, and I have done in a number of areas, Zelda Perkins, who worked in the, um, for Harvey Weinstein. Um, the office in London was, was manned by a woman, by two young women. She was a young graduate, and the young woman who was uh, um, her colleague at work was raped by Weinstein and has, uh, and has had an NDA. Both of them, when they made the complaint and complained back to the American part of the organization, um, uh, immediately lawyers were, were planed over to London and uh, very, the, a firm of lawyers from the Magic Circle brought in and the women silenced and not just silenced um, um, and paid off. Um, but ma it made clear to them that um, they were, if they were to go to therapists, if anything happened where they decided they needed uh, therapy, there had to be consents given by the lawyers uh, uh, for Harvey Weinstein to their getting therapy, that there had to be, um, if they ever um, went to lawyers in a again in the future in relation to these matters, they had to get permission, in or consents had to be given for them to be able to um, disclose anything that had taken place. And so the prohibit the nature and the corruption of a, of a, a, a legal um, measure that was introduced for good reason. Non-disclosure agreements, you know, have legitimacy. Uh, as lawyers will tell you, you know, you're, you're running uh, a business and somebody's, and there are trade secrets and somebody works for you. You don't want them going off to your competitor or taking your client lists with them. And so there are good reasons why when people leave uh, an organization, you might have a non-disclosure agreement attached to their leaving. Um, or you could even imagine in circumstances where there's been a personality conflict, but it's agreed, you know, maybe it's better that one of you goes. It's always, of course, the junior person that goes. 
Um, but the promise is made that you'll get a reference and we'll just never refer to this again. But then it started being used extensively in relation to what are really um, criminal matters. Um, but even less than criminal matters, but to silence women making complaints so that you seeing the common denominators of men repeating behavior over and over again was not, um, was not picked up on. So um, I, I just wanted to say to you this, that I've worked on these issues, sexual violence, the business of policing rape, policing domestic violence, policing assaults on women. And social media has changed the landscape considerably. It's changed the nature of evidence in courts. It's had a huge impact on per perceptions of, of women and women's lives, of course, because they've often displayed so much about their private lives in their social media. And so um, one of the things about the book is to say, some of this has to be addressed, and the legal system itself has to address it. But one of the other things is that men, as well as women, have to together call out behavior that's unacceptable, because there's been too much silence across the board in relation to these things. And I wanted finally to say that one of the scandals in Britain relates to women in prison. We've seen a, an increase in the 20 years from 1995 to 2005. We, um, uh, was it, is that 20 years? Well, I mean, it's basically 2015. In that, two, that, in that 20 years period, we saw a two and a half times increase of women in prison. And when I um, went and interviewed and looked at the work that had been done on some of this, we found it was because of the notion that it was about treating um, about creating equality. And, and you have to sort of start really doing proper judicial training and proper understanding of the fact that to treat as equal those who are not equal, whose social circumstances are so different, um, does not produce um, equality, and it certainly doesn't produce justice. And 82% the, the of women in prison are there for non-violent offences. 65% of them have mental health issues. Many of them, well over 50%, have dependency issues of drugs and alcohol. And the numbers have experienced domestic violence or sexual abuse as children are absolutely huge. These are not women who should be in prison. And the small numbers of women who should be there um, could be housed very differently from the way that uh, uh, we imprison women now. So um, this is a shocking book but it's also a book that actually has solutions, and uh, I hope that you'll take the opportunity of reading it and encourage your young women and men to read it too. Thank you.